Well, good evening. My name is Bill Purcell, and I'm the director of the Institute of Politics here at the Harvard Kennedy School, and it's my great pleasure to welcome all of you to the John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum this evening. We're extremely honored to uh, have here in the forum tonight Senator Norm Coleman. He is with us all of this week as an IOP visiting fellow, uh, where he has maintained, and I know for the balance this week, he will continue to maintain an incredibly robust schedule of events, meeting students from the business school all across this university. Senator Coleman was born in Brooklyn, New York, and it's worth noting that he attended the same high school as Senator Chuck Schumer, Senator Bernie Sanders, Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, all graduates of James Madison High School. Go Knights! <laughs> Senator Coleman also graduated from Hofstra University and then uh, graduated from law school at the University of Iowa before moving to St. Paul, Minnesota, where he began work in the Attorney General's office in a distinguished career which ultimately had him serving in the positions of Chief Prosecutor and later Solicitor General. He was elected the mayor of St. Paul in 1993 as a Democrat. He was reelected in 1997 as a Republican, making him the first Republican mayor of St. Paul since 1960. Uh, mayor Coleman uh, served two terms as mayor and then decided not to seek a third term. Shortly thereafter, he received a call from the President of the United States, who asked him to run for the United States Senate in the year 2002. Mayor Coleman did as his president asked and ran for that Senate seat. He defeated former Vice President Walter Mondale, the first time that Vice President Mondale had ever been defeated in the state of Minnesota. In the Senate, Mr. Coleman, Senator Coleman, chaired two high-profile subcommittees, the Permanent Subcommittee on Investigations and the Foreign Relations sub Subcommittee on the Western Hemisphere. I think for tonight's purposes, it's important to know that at City Hall and in the halls of Congress, Senator Coleman was and is still known as a voice of moderation with a pragmatic approach to problem solving. The hallmarks, I would say, and I think the other mayors who will soon arrive here for our new mayor's program this week would say, the hallmarks of a great mayor. He was one of those mayors that I looked to and other mayors during my time as a candidate and then later as a mayor of a man who really did personify the best things about local government in a city that needed him at that time. The Almanac of American Politics sums up Senator Coleman's political stance and ideology with one of the Senator's own quotes, and I quote him now. What I tried to accomplish was to be part of a coalition that got things done. I try to find ways to get things done. Please join me in welcoming Senator Norm Coleman. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. We uh, shared an experience uh, serving at the bottom of the political food chain uh, as mayors. Uh, but you really do, as a mayor, by the way, learn the importance of getting things done. When it snowed in St. Paul, and when I went to pick up a loaf of bread at Kowalski's Grocery on Grand Avenue, if the streets weren't plowed, you heard about it. There was no escaping, and so you, were, you learned to be responsive. One of the most amazing behind-the-scenes conversations in American politics took place on a train in Indiana in early October 1948. It was exactly four weeks before the presidential election, Harry Truman was whistle-stopping his way through the Midwest. He was riding in his private car with his trusted aide, Clark Clifford. The buzz those days was about a Newsweek article that was about to be published with the predictions of 50 political experts who, on the outcome of the Truman-Dewey race. At one of the early stops, Truman asked Clifford, what does it say? And Clifford said, what do you mean? He said, well, what does the Newsweek story say? And Clifford said, I don't know. And, and Truman said, yes, you do. I saw you slip off the train and go buy a copy of the last stop. That's probably Newsweek right under your coat. Busted, Clifford handed the magazine to Truman. Said that 50 out of 50 experts were predicting a Dewey victory, most by a landslide. Truman looked at the article for a few minutes and said, I know every one of those fellows, and not one of them has enough sense to pound sand down a rat hole. <laughs> a lot of people have expressed that opinion towards expert commentary. By the way, some of it comes out of esteemed academic institutions. Truman's opinion, of course, had the benefit of being right. 
America liked his forthright style, centrist agenda, his and independence swept him to an improbable victory four weeks later. In political and governmental circles, there is a tendency to overcomplicate simple truth. After all, we have newspapers and broadcasts and textbooks to fill. Tonight I want to express and support a simple proposition that America is a center-right nation today as it has been for generations. And it's calling out for leadership that is unifying rather than divisive and bold in its vision of what America can do. I was a mayor for eight years and a senator for six. I have lived at the top and the bottom of the political governmental food chain. I have won elections and I have lost them. So I came to Harvard to share a little bit of what I have learned along the way. Just to fill in a bit more background than Bill gave, I grew up, as he said, in Brooklyn, New York as a Dodgers fan. I went to Hofstra as a campus organizer against the Vietnam War. I grew up in a large Jewish family, was a Democrat, uh, in part because I never met a Republican until I went to college. There just simply weren't any in my neighborhood. I worked for John Lindsay until New York went bankrupt. Then I heard the call of Go West, young man. Attended law school at the University of Iowa. After school, I headed north, drawn by the political magic of the happy warrior, Hubert Humphrey, to work in Minnesota Attorney General's office. I eventually ran for mayor of St. Paul twice, one as a Democrat and one as a Republican. And as part of a downtown revitalization, we built the XL Energy Center, the ground zero for the state of hockey, the home of the Minnesota Wild. I've often told folks here this week, you bring hockey back to, to a place like Minnesota, it's been gone and people think you can walk on water. I then remind them you can walk on water six months of the year anyway in Minnesota. So <laughs> it wasn't a miracle, it was just a very good thing. In 2008, I had the rare pleasure in politics of completing a circle, welcoming my national party to that very building for our national convention. I served in the Senate for six turbulent years, and you know the details of how I ended up here today rather than in Washington. Let's just say I'm not one of the people who is criticizing Coach Bill Belichick this week for a last-minute decision that cost his team the game. Not second-guessing. That education in politics and leadership has led to my thesis today that America is a center-right nation which is seeking that kind of leadership today. First, let me go through some fresh polling data that supports that conclusion. I think we have magic over here. Oh, voila. This is a uh, poll done by Public Opinion Strategy. The question asked, generally speaking, do you consider yourself to be conservative, moderate, or liberal on most issues, as you can see? The graph leans a little right. If you divide it into thirds, it is 28% left, 37% mineral, 41% right. I can tell you the same thing holds true in a state like Minnesota. One of the reasons I like baseball is that there is a game almost every day. That's the same with politics. There's always a new election to analyze and learn from. And let's look at a couple of charts from 2008 and just last Tuesday. In 2008, Chart says independence told the story. Obama won independence by eight and won overall by seven. President Obama may be in his heart of hearts a movement liberal, but he ran as a moderate, post-partisan, and the independent voters bought it. The 8% gap in the middle two bars is almost exactly his margin of victory in the popular vote. I think we could show a similar decisive effect of the independent vote in most of the presidential late races in our lifetime. Now let's look at some recent results. Virginia, New Jersey. As you can see in Virginia, Deeds slightly outperformed Obama among Democrats, but take a look, but he got crushed because McDonald scored a resounding victory among independents, 66-33. Here in the 2008-2009 results, one on top of the other, and I think I have that there, you see a C for Obama-McCain, independence a split, and Obama gains a slight victory. Again, in 2009, McDonald wins the independence and wins a decisive victory. That flashed for a state that flashed blue for one year. Let me move on to, I think, New Jersey. Same is true in Jersey. Chris Christie won because he dominated independence. Same comparison. You look at McCain-Obama versus christie Corzine. Uh, the, sa the same story, a narrow victory among independents won the state for Obama in 2008 and a lopsided preference, 60-30 for Christie over Corzine. Uh, gave him a surprisingly easy victory as well. And here is one more slide that captures the national trend we are seeing. 
Majority voters now think government is doing too many things for the first time in 12 years. The question was two statements about the role of government. Do you think government is doing too many things better left to business and individuals? Or is government should do more to solve problems and help meet the needs of people? Strata is all about government doing too much. You can see that through most of the Bush years, people thought government was doing enough. And now suddenly, for the first time in 12 years, the findings are that government is doing too much. I would suggest that there is a counterpoint between too little and too much in the minds of the American people, and we must find a way to reach that. Now let me attempt to define what I mean by center-right America. I will start by saying what it's not. It's not just a meet in the middle or liberal plus conservative divided by two. I'm reminded of the guy who encountered a statistician with one foot in a pot of boiling water and the other foot on a block of ice. He said, that looks terrible. How are you doing? And the statistician said, well, on average, I'm doing fine. That's not what I'm talking about. My view is that center-right America has, a no has certain noble, enduring values which can lead the country forward boldly if leaders embrace them and articulate them powerfully. If you visit Union Station in Washington, a magnificent structure, by the way, you may see the plaque of dedication to its architect, Daniel Hudson Burnham. He wrote, dream no small dreams, for they have no power to stir men's souls. The center-right vision I'm talking about may be moderate in tone, but it needs to be bold in scope and in passion. Here are five articles of belief that, that I think capture the heart of center-right America. They want better government, not bigger government. They don't agree with either the notion that government is the problem or the solution for America's problems. They, believe in an, a, they may believe in an activist role for government if that action has a few important characteristics. They want government action that reforms the status quo. As mayor of St. Paul, all my efforts to reform government, merging and consolidating various uh, operations in government between city and county bureaucracy, attempts to, to lower the cost of services by, and improve quality by privatizing or outsourcing services, advocacy for education reform, including charter schools, merit pay, opportunity scholarships, vouchers, were all rebuffed by defenders of the status quo which is in large part why I became a Republican. The vast majority of American people aren't opposed to government action, which is general welfare oriented. They just don't want government action, which is a sop to entrench special interest. And they want government action that has good bang for the buck. They want to have the promise of effectiveness and results up front before they are willing to write the check. And in part, that's why health reform is hitting such a bumpy road. There is broad bipartisan consensus in America today, in the halls of Congress, that health care in this country needs reform, that we must strive to bring down costs. We've got to be keeping up quality and access. But center-right America doesn't just want good intentions, they want improvement. I've told the story a couple times in Minnesota, we all know, no offense to any Scandinavians here, the Norwegian who loved his wife so much he almost told her. It's not enough to care, you've got to do something about it. Folks in center-right America, they, they, they want reform, but they, they want it to work. Second item is related to the first. Center-right America will only support tax increases if they're convinced it will improve the country, and the burden of proof is on the tax raisers. We have a lot of center-right people in Minnesota. The key is watching how they spend their money. They clip store coupons. They go to yard sales. They modestly mention to their friends how little their cars, clothes, and lawnmowers cost and perhaps snowmobiles. It drives those people crazy to see government take their hard-earned money and waste it. They believe government is a noble institution and deserves its fair share, but the way their tax dollars, and especially the way the dollars are spent, is crucial to their attitude towards taxes. Center-right America, number three, has an economic vision of this country as a prosperous, competitive nation that generates great jobs and world-changing innovation. They embrace an entrepreneurial spirit rather than a collectivist vision. Do you know what 4406 Kingswell Avenue, Los Angeles, 58 Bagley Avenue, Detroit, and 2066 Chris Drive in Los Altos, California have in common? They have in common that they were all garages in which companies like Disney, Ford, and Hewlett Packard began. Uh, in Minnesota, Medtronic started out in a garage on the north side of Minneapolis. 
okay, and one of the largest producers, makers of, of medical devices uh, in, in the world. Center-right America trusts markets that usually work over government regulation that occasionally does. They are ready to bet on the fact that we can invent our way out of problems and are slow to accept a bigger government footprint in their lives. They measure progress in job creation, not in Washington bill signing ceremonies and accumulation of debt. Center-right America believes it is the duty of the judiciary to interpret the laws in light of the original intent of the Constitution, not use its power to make social changes that legislatures are unwilling to do. Certain traditional values and relationships are the anchor of our culture in turbulent times. There is a reason that politicians on both sides of the aisle continue to follow the will of the voters on such controversial issues, such as the long-standing definition of marriage, the balance between free exercise of religion and the Establishment Clause in the First Amendment and respect for life. And at least in Minnesota and most other parts of the country, pity the politician who comes between a citizen and their personal Second Amendment rights. And of course, using the courts as a shortcut to change would be a mistake. When the founders used the term Supreme Court, they meant it was supreme among the courts, not supreme in the balance of power among the branches. And although those social issues are the ones, by the way, that engender the most passion and resolve, and I understand that, we also must strive as Americans not to let the debate over traditional values so damage our unity that our ability to achieve consensus on difficult and pressing issues like health care, social security, and national security is destroyed. We can't let that happen. And finally, center-right America believes we are exceptional in the world and view strength as the path to peace. They harbor no illusions that we are perfect, but they maintain a strong pride in America as having in Churchill's phrase, the worst form of government except for all the others. It may seem like a below the radar thing, but I think there is a major negative reaction in center-right America when the president bows to the emperor of Japan or the king of Saudi Arabia. Courtesy is one thing, but we don't willingly surrender, even symbolically that they are better than us. Center-right America believes in a strong defense to back up aggressive diplomacy to achieve America's security and economic interest. Support for Israel, the Middle East's only functioning democracy, is part of that as well. We still believe Lincoln's words that America is, quote, the last best hope of Earth, and think our leaders should act accordingly. All these values find expression in the legislative process and fiscal policy and governmental oversight and trade policy and renewable energy efforts. And there are center-right people in both parties, especially, by the way, in the Senate, where I served. And there are lots of center-right mayors and governors as well, people who view politics, as Hubert Humphrey said, as the art of the possible. Let me offer one example from my time in the Senate when we almost came together. America needs to end its dependency on foreign oil. Energy dependence is a national security issue. Hugo Chavez and, and Ahmadinejad would have less bark and less bite if we lessened our dependence on foreign oil. If you're concerned about the Middle East, concerned about Israel's security, you should be committed to energy independence. And the path is clear. This is not a complicated one. More conservations, more renewable, more environmentally safe exploration, and more nuclear energy. And I will tell you that Democrats like Ken Conrad and Mark Pryor, Mary Landro, Tom Carper, Amy Klobuchar, know this, that we're part of a group with myself and folks like John Thune and Saxby Chambliss and Susan Collins and Lindsey Graham and others, about 15 of us. And we worked together in 2007 to lay out a comprehensive approach that would have done it all, each of us giving a little bit, but would have moved the ball forward. And in the end, leadership on both sides of the aisle didn't let it go through. We've got to do better than that. We know what we need, and we have to have the ability to move it forward. And finally, I think it's a pretty good prediction of the future majority in the, who the future majority in the Congress will be. And the question be which party welcomes its center-right people along with its most hardcore members? Will the Republicans hold and support both my friends, and they are my friends, Susan Collins and Tom Coburn? Or will the Democrats hold both Barbara Bloxer and, and Blanche Lincoln? The one that does will stake a legitimate claim to independence. And that will give them a lasting majority with which to govern. 
In 2008, American voters spoke loud and clear. They wanted change. They wanted to change Washington. But I don't believe that they wanted to change America. Let me close with my favorite story about the hero and expression of the center-right movement that I have been talking about, Abraham Lincoln. On August 13, 1859, long-shot candidate Lincoln was visiting the Omaha, Nebraska area in search of delegates. But he had another reason for being there. Omaha was the terminus of the major Eastern Railroad, and the town was filled with great railroad leaders. After his day of campaigning, he crossed the river to Council Bluffs, Iowa, to stay at the Pacific Hotel. That evening, he gathered the local rail experts for dinner over cigars and adult beverages. They sat on the west-facing porch of the hotel, and Lincoln asked the question, what's the best rail route to the Pacific? They pointed northwest the Platte River Valley. Almost 10 years later, Lincoln had died. The nation had gone through a horrendous civil war. But the Union had been preserved, slaves had been freed, and on a mountain pass in Utah, the golden spike was driven, completing Lincoln's dream for the nation, uniting us from east to west, from coast to coast, from sea to shining sea. Lincoln should be our model and inspiration as a nation. He based his service not on expediency or politics, but on enduring values. He built a team of rivals who had the strength to guide the nation through terrible times. He embraced the noblest vision of America and therefore dreamed great dreams. That is my hope and expectation for America because I believe that is our hope and expectation for ourselves as a nation. All we need now is the Lincolns to give us the leadership that we want and deserve. Another Norman, Vincent Peale, put it this way, challenge people to, to be a possibilitarian. He said, become a possibilitarian. He said, no matter how dark things seem or may actually be, he said, always lift your sights and look to the possibilities because they're always, always there. That is the ultimate value of center right and of all Americans. We are always a work in progress, but we deeply believe that progress is always being made. Thank you very much. Senator Coleman has agreed to take questions, and as always uh, in this forum, we look forward to questions from members of the community and our students. There are four microphones arranged in the usual places around the John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum. A question at Harvard has, and I believe always will, three characteristics. It's short. It contains one thought. And at the end of the question, there is always a question mark. Please state your name and your affiliation for the senator before asking your question, and we'll start right over here. All right. Hi, thank you. My name is Stephanie Lewis, and I'm a junior at the college. I'm wondering, um, on the attempt to try to go more moderate, um, do you think that trying to reinstate sort of personal relationships in the Senate, um, even in this day that everyone's flying back to their own districts, uh, could be possible? And so what frequency would you advocate? Now the, the, the question of personal relationships is, is an interesting one. One of the things that uh, we have in the Senate uh, is we have hideaways. And hideaways are uh, places in the Capitol, little private rooms. They're, they're your office. By the way, you can smoke a cigar there, and you can have a drink there, and it's your space. And, and it is a, it's a, a space where quite often, in between debate, we get together without looking at party line. Uh, you don't do enough of it. I mean, one of the challenges today is you watch C-SPAN, all you see is debate and usually discord. Uh, but at least in the Senate, there really is an opportunity to, to do that. By the way, it's much greater in the House, much greater. Structurally, the House, the, the rules of the House are set up so that it's win and take all. The, the strong devour the weak. You got, you, if you're in the minority, you have no say and, and very little to do. But the Senate was set up to require you to actually talk to somebody on the other side because it's usually pretty hard to get 60. And as a result, you really need to have that relationship that says, you know something, I gotta find out if, if if you know, Mark Pryor can support this, or he has to find out whether, whether a, a, a Susan Collins 
or, or Norm Coleman or George Boynton or whatever, any, well, Tom Coburn. I mean, you have to make the effort, depending on when we had 55, they had 45. You know, you'd have to find out, well, some of us support some of their stuff. And let me just say one other point, long answer, short question, but I'm from the Senate, so we tend to do that. Uh, it's not, the, the, what I'm talking about is not necessarily a drive to moderation. One of it, it's, it's, and I, I'm just, gonna, how do you phrase it? Uh, I think there, as I try to say here, I think there are certain kind of core values that, but that most of us that we can agree on, that the vast majority of us can agree on, and, and it's, I guess it's about finding common ground. We're talking about can you find common ground? One of the great masters that I have to say was, was in his own way was Ted Kennedy. Uh, and the thing about Kennedy was interesting it was one, when you disagree with him, you know that. And, and he was pretty clear, that was, he was there. But he'd also try to find out is there a path that we, something we can agree on. And if he did and he gave you his word, he was good for it, which is an important thing in the Senate. But he was at least willing to have the conversation. You know where he stood, it was quite often a different place than I was, though we did co-chair the Senate Arts Caucus together. But it was the ability to find common ground and the willingness to search for it through personal relationships that really made a difference. Uh, yes, my name is Michael Brower. I got a PhD from this school long ago, before it was the uh, Kennedy School, it was the Litauer School then. Um, my question has to do with American militarism. This country, we spend one half our taxpayer dollars on our military. We have a military budget larger than every other country in the world combined. And we have killed in Iraq and Afghanistan tens of thousands of innocent women and children. I'd like to know what is your center-right position on America killing overseas innocent women and children and invading other countries and being, in my view, the last imperialist, militarist country in the world? Obviously, we disagree. Um, let me respond, though, more, more, more fully. Um, Colin Powell once, uh, my, my dad was uh, World War II, landed on the shores of Normandy, wounded in the Battle of the Bulge, was there at the liberation of one of the Nazi death camps. You know, Colin Powell once said that, that we don't, uh, when we fight overseas, uh, we don't claim land, we haven't claimed land, we, we accept the land to bury our dead. Uh, I sat in the, in, the, in the United States Senate, uh, one of the votes that I had the chance to participate in was the vote to provide the extension of NATO to some of the Eastern European countries, seven of them. And I remember George Voinovich standing, excuse me, I, I remember, uh, I say Voinovich because he was there at the signing of that, but I was standing there next to Dick Luger. And Luger pointed up in the gallery and they were the foreign minister of all the uh, seven Eastern European countries, and he said to me, he said, you know, this may be my X thousands vote. I don't know which one it was. He says, but to the folks up there, this is the most important thing in their lives, that America stands for, for, for the, the, the ability of them not to kind of fall back into the Soviet empire. Where we would disagree is, is that I think that this has been a, a nation that has used its military strength to, to liberate, to support freedom and democracy. We're not always perfect. But I, I think having a strong military is, is essential to the freedom we have. And I have to tell you, you go around the world, most folks still want to come here because they look at the freedom and the opportunity we have here, and that comes at a price. So I, I, I simply disagree. I believe, and I believe that most Americans believe, that having a strong military is, is critical to the preservation of democracy. And there are lots of folks around the world who are thankful that we have that strong military. Hi, Senator Coleman, thank you for coming. My name is Tarun Singh, I'm a senior at the college. Um, so I had a question, you mentioned the Supreme Court uh, shouldn't meddle in uh, affairs outside of the judiciary, but considering that the Supreme Court has been influential in providing social change, for example, with Brown versus Board of Education, where do you draw the line as where the Supreme Court uh, causes social change versus where the Supreme Court is just reflective of the social change that the center right wants? Yeah, that, by the way, that's, that's, a, that's a very good question because that line is, is, is at, at, you know, sometimes it's not the clearest line. It, it's, it's, you know, sometimes there are clear lines, you know, when you see it. Uh, but on that issue, it, it's, it, it's not always clear. 
Uh, but I think fundamentally, if, if you just kind of uh, on basic stuff that comes before the court, I, I think the intent is, is to use the framework of the Constitution. And, and the, the challenge, here's the problem you have, is that your vision of social change uh, may be different from the vision of some judge. And there's a danger in somebody using, and I, using the power of a judge to implement his or her version of social change that is not change that the vast majority of, of Americans are looking for. Uh, and so uh, I, I think there is greater danger in individual jurists using, taking their own personal sense of this is good social change and using that. So I think there was some genius in the Constitution, the founders, uh, setting forth principles of that uh, of uh, the Constitution as kind of the basis for the decisions that the court make, and I think it has served us well. And along the way, ha has, have some things taken longer than they should have? Yes. But even, but even so, I am much more comfortable with looking to the will of the people as expressed by the legislature than turning that enormous power over to an individual or a small group of individuals who will decide to implement their vision of social change. So I think it's something we have to be sensitive to. The answer to that, by the way, is, is, is why it's important to be involved. The way to deal with that issue is, is to be, uh, be involved in the political process so that you have the will of social change being expressed by a legislature so that you move people to action. That's, that's why, and I, I think it was Hubert Humphrey, somebody once said, government's eye is gonna do something to you or for you, it's gonna do something. So I think the answer to your question is to be involved in social change that is then reflected in the actions of the legislatively elected persons who represent you rather than the danger of individual jurists using their own personal definition. They may call social change something you don't like. And I'd much prefer to, this, this is where, I believe in representative democracy, but you know, meaning I make my own decisions based on what I think is right or wrong. But I really think listening to the will of the people is a pretty good thing. Uh, and, and if you're concerned about great change, I think that's where to make it is, is, is in the halls of Congress or your legislature, rather than one person behind in an office uh, with a robe behind a bench. Thank you. Senator, right up here. Yes. Hi, my name is Chris uh, Fruge. I'm a freshman here at the school. My question was, if America is a center-right nation, do you believe that more of a focus on get-out-the-vote campaigns would benefit the Republican Party? Yeah, I, I actually do. I, I, and in saying that, let me tell you the challenge facing the Republican Party. Uh, and that is that as a party, uh, that we have to do a better job of reaching out to constituencies that we haven't done a good job of lately. We don't have, if you look at a map of the United States, the northern tier of the United States, other, other than Olympian Susan in, in Maine, Maine is maybe a special case, there's not a single Republican senator across the vast expanse, okay, shooting you know, New York and Pennsylvania and, and in Illinois, Michigan, Illinois, uh, Minnesota, North Dakota, Montana. I don't count that little strip of, of Idaho in there. Uh, we, we have to do a better job of, I, I think, I believe America's a center right nation, I believe it is today, uh, but I think we have to do a better job of reaching out to certain constituencies if we expect to be a majority party. We've got to do a better job of reaching out to Hispanics, we've got to do a better job of reaching out to women, we've got to do a better job of reaching out to youth. We've got to be, do a better job of, of reaching, I mean, that's, that's our challenge and we haven't. And if we don't do a good job, then we're gonna become a regional party. And so I really believe that we have an opportunity based on our values and our principles of it, to, to be a majority party, uh, but we have to work harder at it than we have and we have to do better than we've done. Yes. Hi, my name is Lewis Evans. I'm a freshman at the college. Um, you began your talk with a pretty powerful demonstration of the effect of the uh, independent vote on elections and you later outlined a notion of a center-right um, constituency. What I didn't quite see so strongly was the connection. What evidence or experience do you have that supports that these independents are motivated by the center-right values and particularly the political center-right values rather than the commonsensical center-right values that you outlined in the second half of your speech? Well, the, the, uh, you know, the, the chart and, and other charts I could have used, but the one that talked about the, belt, the curve of where Americans are and, and that they identified themselves as conservative 
and is conservative then on conservative on issues that, that I've uh, issues on taxes and spending and a range of other things. I, I, I if you look at the folks even in the Christie and the uh, and the McDonald race, uh, the center right were folks that weren't affiliated with either party. They were independent. In fact, I think there is some perspective. Some folks say that in many cases, a lot of that group over there that is still the majority. There are a lot of Republicans in that group who simply called themselves independents. A lot of what Christian McDonald got back was, was some of the base that had pulled away. But I think it's pretty fair to say that the data, if, if you tie in the, 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 if you have the belief that I have, which I believe is, is confirmed by data, that most Americans define themselves as more conservative than liberal, then I think if you then list the pantheon of kind of issues in which are conservative versus liberal, you're more apt to be successful if you're sent to right. Yes. Hi, my name is Ariella Rotenberg. I'm from Minneapolis, Minnesota, and I'm a freshman here at the college. Um, my, sen my question for you, Senator, is as a college-age liberal activist yourself, do you think it's possible for the Republican Party to appeal to students on college campuses where the sentiment is generally liberal? And by what means do you think they can accomplish this? Let me give you an observation about this generation, uh, which I think, and, and I think we should do a better, as, as center-right Republicans should be, do a better job. And, and I'll give an example why. This generation, by the way, I say this not, not just as, as a senator kind of reading polls and other stuff, but uh, my wife, Lori, and I, we have a 23-year-old uh, who is a sophomore, the second-year student, University of Minnesota Law School, and a daughter, Sarah, who's 19 at, at Notre Dame. So we're kind of in the game. I'm, you know, I'm trying to understand. I don't spend a lot of time going on their Facebook pages, but we are friends. Uh, but but let, me, let, me give you a, let me give you an observation about this, my, about this generation, why I think there's opportunity for what I've talked about. This is probably the most self-reliant generation in history. Uh, and technology has given them that opportunity. Uh, well, when I, <laughs> I'm dating myself, uh, if, we'd buy records, okay? Uh, some people, eight tracks, okay? LPs, C, uh, tapes, uh, CDs, and today I, I suspect that you're, you're going online and picking out an individual song. I don't know when the last time that you even bought a CD. We have, we have hundreds of CDs in our house, <laughs> hundreds. And what I have to do is take the time to enter as many as I can when I find the time into my computer so I can get it on the computer and then I can transfer it over to my MP3 or whatever. So you, this is a generation that chooses its songs individually. When we travel, we would call a travel agent. You, I don't know if there are travel agents around anymore. There are, but you're not calling a travel agent. You're going to Expedia or you're going on somewhere else and you're picking where you go and making your own choices. When our daughter graduated high school, uh, we wanted to have a, a graduation party, and so we were going to send out invitations. He said, uh, Mom, Dad was watching, uh, you don't have to do that. I, I've got all my friends right here on Facebook. Okay, we, we sent out the invitations anyway. It's like belt and suspenders. But my point is that this is a generation that, that, that for a whole range of reasons, is in such control of their lives. And now you've got a choice between two governing philosophies. One philosophy says that on the issue of health care, I'm going to tell you which doctor that you can go to. I'll tell you what the procedure cost. Okay? I'm going to tell you this, and, and government will control this process. And the other, the other one says, let me give you more information. Go online, figure out things like uh, uh, health savings accounts. Figure out uh, wh where you want to go. Look at quality, look at cost. Make the choices. So a choice between individual control versus a, a, which I believe is a philosophy that says more government. I mean, do your generation really want the government to run General Motors? I don't think so. I think what you do want, here's the challenge we face. I think you want to make sure that every American has access to quality health insurance. I, I think you want to see a bigger heart from, from folks on my team. This is a generation that, from what I see, that they care, they really care. You want to see us more environmentally conscious, and we need to be more environmentally conscious at the same time, be cognizant of some of the impact on, on jobs. But you can be both. You don't have to be in opposition to environment, you know, uh, to strong environmental uh, positions. I mean, gosh, from, from a, for, you know, those who are faith-based, the, the early on in the Bible, we're stewards of this earth. A lot of reasons why we should be 
you know, strong on the environment, but particularly your generation. My point being, if you're looking at, at, a, at a contest of philosophies, I think the philosophy of conservatives really is more in line with the reality of your generation. I just don't think we've done a good job of articulating it. Yes. Senator, my name is Josh Archambault. I'm a second year student here at the Kennedy School. Thank you for coming. My question, you've talked a little bit about center-right leadership in the legislative process. Can you speak a little bit about center-right leadership in the State House? I, I, when I say legislative process, I don't, I don't think that it's, when you say State House, it's state government versus at the federal level. I, I don't think there is much difference. I, I think the challenge, I think the challenge that we have, and it goes to one of the earlier questions, uh, and that is of, of generating leadership at the local level. Uh, that, is, that has been our challenge. And in part, I mean, this may seem simplistic, and at Harvard I don't want to talk simplistically, but on the one hand, you, you, know, you, have, you have one group where government really is the, the kind of, it is, it, if, if you're the public employee union, government is it. Okay? It's your life, your life. If you're the trial lawyers, you depend on it for your life. And on the other hand, the folks that I'm talking about quite often come up for running a small business, which, by the way, is really hard. It takes a lot of time. You'd mostly like to just get government off your back and, and, and not even bother with it. And so one of our challenges at the local level of finding candidates who have a philosophy that, I, that I'm talking about that, that have the willingness to put themselves forward for electoral process at, at the state and local level. And I think that's been a challenge. But I think the same principles hold true. And I'll go back to the look at, if you look at uh, Virginia in this last election, what we saw in the governor's race was also reflected in the House of Delegates, some of the same changes. And so I think what I said about it holds true not just at the federal level, but the state level, I think there's a challenge we have of getting leadership that shares that vision willing to raise its hand and say, I want to be involved in the political process. I think we face a, I think we face a greater burden there, greater challenge. Hi, Senator. Thank you for coming. Um, my name's Nicole. I'm a second year at the, first year at the business school. Um, and I was wondering, you touched on how um, the center-right can appeal to the younger generation from a big government, small government perspective. But I was just wondering what you thought in terms of social issues, such as abortion and gay marriage, that um, the younger generation tends to lean more liberally on. How do you think Republican candidates can identify with younger generations when it comes to things like that? Uh, in some ways, it's a greater challenge, to be very blunt. Uh, I'm working on a, a uh, uh, public policy institute that's gonna focus on economic issues and national security, and let others argue about social issues, and I have strong positions on them, but I think I have a better opportunity to find, kind of pull folks together as a unifying force on those issues, which by the way, are the issues that you'll deal with and your family will deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. When you wake up in the morning, you're gonna, the first thing, you're probably gonna be thinking about, are you going to work? You're probably gonna think about the cost of food, you're probably going to be thinking about the quality of your kid's education. You're probably going to be thinking about your safety. And I, and I have to tell you that very rarely, the message are you going to be thinking about what's happening with Roe versus Wade today. And so in part, in part, I, I think the answer may be, even on those tough issues, can you find common ground? So for instance, on the issue of life and the issue of abortion, partial birth abortion is opposed by Massive numbers of people, overwhelming majority of Americans, focus on an issue that has overwhelming support. Parental notification, things that have overwhelming support, if you can try to find those. And I think, by the way, where there is common ground for both folks in that side of the debate is doing those things that support young women so they're not in a position where they have to have an abortion. Be working on those where you can. See if you can find some common ground. And, 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 and I think that's the challenge. And on the issue, the, the issue of, 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 of gay rights, can you, can, you, can you find some common ground to say, yeah, if, if, the, issue, the, the issue about the debate over the definition of, of marriage is a pretty narrow issue, fundamental. Here's what marriage is about. That doesn't mean that civil unions 
don't take place. It doesn't mean that you can find ways to accommodate people, have relationships. But there is something about the definition of marriage that still is a very strong majority position. And we even saw that recently in Maine. So if you can find things that still provide some common ground, I don't think you turn a blind eye. I don't think you walk away. But I do think that most of the discussion should be on what's going to impact you day to day, every single day. And if that's the case, I think there's, we got, we're in a pretty good place. And then on those more difficult social issues, I think you still have to say, can I find some common ground? I, I, I want gay Americans, I want them in the Republican Party. That's important to me, part of the coalition. And, 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 and for my friends who are gay or in the party, for them, economic issues are the most important. They're important. But you also want to make sure that treated with dignity and a whole range of other things so they feel welcome in the party. But is, is it a challenge? Yes. But is there a path to get there? I think there is. And the key is where you can find common ground, seize it. Uh, thank you for coming, uh, Senator Coleman. My name is uh, Ray Martin, and I'm a first year master's student here. Um, my question is directly related to your topic tonight. Um, recently, uh, you know, in 2008, you lost uh, Gordon Smith, another very moderate Republican lost. In the 23rd, we saw what happened to a moderate Republican, and now Charlie Crist is on the ropes in uh, Florida. So, you know, do we really have hopes of, you know, finding people who are pragmatic and moderate in the Republican Party and having them be successful? Because now we're seeing a trend where that's not happening. Well, I, I would, I would uh, argue or, uh, or maintain that there's not a trend. Uh, and you know, John Sununa lost. Uh, Elizabeth Dole lost. Uh, a lot of folks lost in 2008. And, and by the way, I, and I'll say it up front, I got more votes election night. I got more votes when the machines were counted. In the end, went through election process, more absentee ballots were counted for the other guy than for me. But again, in 2000, I don't think that trend was about moderate. And in 2008, the economy collapsed in October. I can tell you that, that we were very confident of victory in October. We thought the race was over. Uh, Saxby Chambliss, in 2008, was forced into a runoff in Georgia. Uh, and in part, the, if you go back to the, the time, it was the, the most significant economic collapse in, in, in the lifetime of just about anybody, almost everybody in this room. That was 2008. So I don't think there is a trend. Uh, I, I think it's, uh, here's a challenge, I'll give you two challenges. And, and again, I think Gordon Smith, the same thing, it was 2008. And it, in, in 2006, which was a bad year for us, we lost a guy like Jim Talent in Missouri. I think the wrong track, and the polling I saw right before the election was about 67, maybe 70%. Incumbents tend to do better when people are feeling better, right track, wrong track. If, you, if the wrong track is 70, 65, 70 percent, you've got a problem. On election day in 2008, the wrong track was about 97 percent. I mean, that was a wave. If anything, one of my problems, I'll, I'll tell you though, candidly, just among friends and being recorded on the web, uh, <laughs> one of the challenges I had was that in, in October of 2008, uh, I voted for the, the, uh, the, the the first bailout. Seventy something of us in the Senate voted for the bailout. And we did because you had the head of the Federal Reserve and you had the Secretary of the Treasury come before you and say to you that if you, we didn't cast this vote and provide some stability for these financial institutions, the economy of the United States was going to collapse. Collapse. Massive unemployment, inability of parents to, to afford to send their kids to school, to buy a car, collapse. So there's a reason Tom Coburn and I voted for that, because we really felt that even if it impacted an election, it was the right vote to take. Saxby once said to me, he thought he lost 100,000 votes voting for that. I was on the right. Uh, and I got to believe that I lost. If I look at areas where I should have gotten 65% of the vote, maybe I got 59. That probably had as big, a, the collapse of the economy had a huge impact in having to cast that vote. So I would respectfully suggest that there isn't a pattern that says that pragmatic-minded individuals can't win. I would suggest just the opposite. Uh, in, in Minnesota, in Minnesota, it's a very tough state, but for the collapse of the economy, I don't think the race would have been close. Uh, and I think across the board, if you look, we've got to find candidates who can win in places like Minnesota. 
Is it tough? Yes. Is it tough in Oregon? Yes. But if you're to be a majority party, you have to have carry races in places other than the South and the Far West. Good evening, Senator Coleman. I'm a visitor from Scotland on an executive program here. My name's Malcolm Graham. I'm very grateful for hearing your views on domestic issues in the United States tonight. My question relates to your experiences mentioned in the introduction from uh, Homeland Security and Foreign Relations, and it's this. What impact has United States foreign policy had over the last 12 years or so on global developments in terrorism and countering terrorism? Right, that's a, that's going to be, if I try to keep a short answer to a question that has a lot of, a, a lot of width to it. Uh, first, we live in a, uh, in a world that's very different today. And the, the issue of, of uh, global terrorism, uh, it hit home here on September 11th, but certainly was an issue before that. In this country alone, in the 90s, mid-90s, we experienced the bombing of the World Trade Center, the bombing of, of, uh, of the USS Cole, the embassy bombings in Africa. So it's not a, this, this ha has been a, a problem that has gone on for a period of time. I'm going to say up front, I, I, I do not believe, I firmly do not believe that, 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 that somehow the United States, and I don't know if the question's inferring that, uh, that the United States somehow has, uh, is, is the cause of that, uh, that U.S. policy somehow is the cause of that. Uh, I think the uh, uh, misguided notions uh, of a group of very zealous individuals uh, have caused a great deal of death and destruction against their own people as well as against others. And, and so in the, uh, so I, if, and I'm not sure whether the question was inferring that somehow is U.S. policy kind of tied to that. I, I think that we have, uh, are engaged in a very difficult battle. And it's not just us, it's not just the U.S.'s, it's England, it's Great Britain's, been there, Spain. Uh, it's, it's, you know, the, it's uh, the world. It's, it's a problem for the Middle East, countries in the Middle East, for their own stability. I think we have tried a course of, of, of uh, or a belief that if we could somehow ensure or support greater democracy, that somehow that would lessen the, the fervor of terrorism and fanaticism. Uh, as, as costly as Iraq, as the Iraq intervention, as, as costly as it has been, uh, it is also offers the possibility of, of, of democracy in an area that hasn't seen it. I, I think if you look at, I, I, I was talking to some folks the other night who were in the service who had been in Iraq in 2004 when I visited and then later in 2006 and seven among my other trips and the transformation is really pretty stunning. So there is at least a, a hope or a belief that that is part of a path. Uh, but uh, that is, that's the subject for a course at Harvard for a semester uh, rather than a short answer. I'll, I'll suffice to say we live in a challenging world. The threat of, of, of terrorism, Islamic terrorism, is a great threat, but it's not just the United States threat. It's a threat to, uh, uh, to folks around the world. I had a, a conversation one time uh, with Abu Mazen Abbas who was talking ab about, uh, ab about Hamas and certain actions that, would, that, that they did uh, in, in uh, taking over in Gaza and throwing folks out of a window. These are their own people. And Abbas is talking to me about that, and he was talking about things that we need to do to make sure that we don't support that, that we show resolve. I visited with the, the Syrian ambassador, uh, the Egyptian, the, the Saudi ambassador, who asked me, what are we, where is our resolve in dealing with Iran, uh, who is fostering uh, a terrorism around the world? And so I think it's a very complicated question uh, without a, you know, a single answer. Uh, but uh, all I would say is that we're, we're simply, we're doing our best. And uh, it's a discussion that uh, I'd like to continue being involved in somehow, because I really think it's that important. Thank you. Uh, Jeb Roddy, mid-career student. I just sort of interested in the economy and um, 
wanted to get your view on that because we're seeing we've seen unemployment now exceed 10 percent in some parts of the country it's 20 percent among those 20 years older and less it's 28 percent so it's very significant and it seems to Ben Bernanke just announced last night that he anticipates it, it growing and a lot of money has been thrown at the problem but banks don't seem to be lending yet um, what is, you know, I, I know it's also a question quite a lot of width, but you know, how can we get this back on track? Well, I, I don't think we can get it back on track simply by government spending. Uh, and and I, I say that with a concern uh, for the inability to spend, and I think we saw that with the stimulus bill. I, th I think it's fair to say that if you look at the stimulus bill, that e even the reports of what it was supposed to have done are now being challenged in terms of growing jobs. and and. More than that, I'm concerned both about short term, which are critical, and, and long term. Uh, that if we look at, it's not about just $1.7 trillion deficits over in the next year, it's $17 trillion worth of debt in 10 years. And the interest that this generation, it's going to be their problem even more than ours because it's going to continue to grow. Uh, and so uh, I, I, I don't think that uh, government spending alone is the key. By the way, and I, do, I support spending on infrastructure. If there was a way to target some of that spending for, for you know, shovel-ready jobs today that would have had an impact, I, I'd be more supportive. Uh, but I do believe that, that, that tax policy, I'm still a believer, I'm, I'm a Jack Kemp kind of guy, I'm still a believer that, that tax policy that, that gets capital out in the marketplace, that makes it market, uh, capital more accessible, uh, is critical. I think lowering the uh, some of the tax rates that business faces so that we can compete more internationally are important. I think we could send tremendous signals if we, oh, if we pass some of the free trade acts that are being held up for protectionist reasons, which I think are disastrous in a global economy. Disastrous. Uh, yeah, and, and I'd add to that that uh, in, in the case of Colombia, who is our strongest ally in Latin America, it is both bad economic policy for us to hold that up as well as it's bad for the statement we make about someone who is been such a strong ally. And, and so, uh, like the other question, you're right, it's not subject to the, I don't think anything we're gonna do right now, right this moment is gonna stop that unemployment rate from, you know, drop it from 10 to eight. If you read. There's sort of a vacuum in terms of policy to create jobs, I mean, have, uh, you, have you heard a viable plan to actually create jobs? I, I, it's interesting, what you're gonna see is you're gonna see Congress, uh, and, and we'll see how long they debate on health care. But you're going to see, between now and Christmas, a lot of action, a lot of action on jobs. Yeah, there are some policies out there, but, but they're, not, they're not getting publicity because it's not on the floor. It's not the focus. I actually think that unemployment hitting over 10 percent is, is, is the key, unfortunately, unfortunately, that's going to cause a greater reflection on, okay, put up. Show us some things that, that are going to have a difference today other than just simply stimulus spending. So I'm actually, I, 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 I think it's fair, I'd say right now that you are gonna see focus on jobs uh, before Congress, and they may go into Christmas. That's what they're gonna be focused on. And yes, there are some proposals out there that will get gen greater capital in the marketplace, that will support uh, uh, manufacturing and business growth in a global market, and that will have an impact. The question is, can we focus on those things and find some common ground? It really goes to the heart of my discussion, because I really believe that there is consensus on doing some of those things if we can get past this terrible partisan divide. Okay. Hope so. Thank you. I think we have time for two more questions. There's one here, and I believe one up here. Thank you, Senator McCormick, for being here. My name is Aaron. I'm an MLA candidate. Um, my question is, do you think that your Senate right colleagues in the House and the Senate their refusal to reject the far right of your party, the birthers, the, um, the, the conspiracy, the deathbed stuff, the Nazi imagery. Do you think that's going to affect your party in the long run? I, I don't think that uh, the, the folks that, the groups that you've mentioned are either part of the, you know, are, are accepted in the party or uh, central to the discussion. Well, if I may. I, 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 really, I, I really don't. Uh, you know, the fact, let me just, an observation. Is there anger out there today? Yeah, there's anger. Uh, there's anger over, over the economy. Unemployment's at 
There's anger over what people feel is over-intrusiveness of government. There's a lot of anger out there, and, and folks saw it. They saw it in meetings. So uh, if you're talking about anger, I don't think you reject anger. I think we understand that it's there, but I think our response to it is how do you find concrete solutions so that you channel the anger into something that makes sense. But, but I would, uh, uh, it, you know, to somehow lay claim to say this is a party of some fringe group, you could say the same thing on the left. And, and so I don't think my, co my colleagues in, in the Senate or uh, hopefully my folks in the Senate right, and, and I think within throughout the Senate are focusing not on what birthers are talking about, so let, let's let them have that debate. They, I, hopefully they're focusing on the question that this gentleman, the last two questions, what do you do with terrorism in the world and what do you do with the economy? I think those other things are external, but I think it would be a mistake. I, 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 hope, I hope what you're not saying, and your question didn't phrase it this way, but if you're talking about is there anger out there and what are you doing about it, I think that we recognize, listen to the people, try to understand what they're angry about, and then I think we have the responsibility of finding solutions that in the end will transfer that anger into some sort of constructive energy. May I just follow up briefly? Yeah. Uh, um, I, I guess I was never, well, you actually have congressmen at rallies with people holding up these types of signs. I'm not, I'm not saying that your party is, um, they're part of your party or they're welcomed in your party, but they refuse to um, denounce these types of things and they're actually encouraging it, some of it. Um, the, the Michelle Bachmans out there and whatnot. And, and, and I'm just wondering if, you know, they're refusing to do so to score quick sort of political points and whether or not that's going to hurt the party in the long run. I mean, yourself, would you denounce those types of tactics well, now? Or? But here's, here's, where I think you're, here's where I think you're off base and I say it respectfully. Sure. Uh, Michelle Bachman is, uh, it, she's not, out, she's out there articulating those things that she believes that are, are protesting and things that she thinks weakens this country, supporting things that she thinks strengthens this country. She's, I have no doubt, going to get reelected by her constituents. Uh, I, think you're, I think you're mischaracterizing what a Michelle Bachman's about and what others are about. You're mixing... Well, why would they not denounce that? Well, they, well, at rallies, you know, the same thing, let me, they, you know, on the left, I mean, I, I've, I've, you, you, see one of the, you see rallies on the left uh, where, you know, you, you may have things about uh, uh, Israel being a, a, a racist apartheid state. I don't believe that. I'd ask my Jewish colleagues, are you rejecting that? Well, they're at a, the, the, this is America. There are people who will show up on rallies on the left and rallies of the right. It, it's a diverse country. But I, I think your, your basic notion is mistaken that somehow you're tying in the, the anger that individuals have with the opinions of elected officials. And I, and I, I simply disagree. I disagree with, with your assertion of a judgment about Michelle Bachman and what she stands for. I disagree with your, uh, your view that somehow uh, if a Republican's at a rally with somebody as a sign that may be disturbing to you or others, and may, probably to me, that somehow, uh, this, rather than give the speech that I want to give on health care and jobs and energy, I should somehow say, I, you know, I get that person out of here. I can assure you, I'm thinking, I wish that person wasn't here. Uh, but I, I would disagree with your notion that, that somehow uh, that they're, you know, that's who they are. Where you and I may disagree, and I think it's a fundamental disagreement, is, is I think you're misreading, you're taking something way out on the fringe, and you're then applying it to the legitimate concern and anger that folks have. The folks who show up at the tea parties are expressing an, an anger. Now, there may be some in that crowd that I say, I don't agree with you. But I think it's important to recognize, and by the way, I think folks on both sides of the aisle are recognizing that's, that's real. I initially, the thought was that somehow that was manufactured. We could manufacture that. That's a real expression of concerns that Americans have about what's going to happen to their health care. A real concern about expressions, Amer Americans, concerns Americans have about the reach of government. And I think those are legitimate to, to be concerned about, uh, but that doesn't mean that you countenance each and every sign or each and every position of every person at a rally. Thanks. Uh, we have one more question. Absolutely. One more. Good evening. My name is Ghansham Tiwari. Uh, you talked about anger. Uh, my question is, how do you reconcile uh, this with respect to the significant improvement that has happened uh, on, the f on the overall uh, foreign policy uh, 
view that the world has about America compared to what was there in the previous administration, and as well as the, the tremendous challenges that, were, that uh, this administration started with. Given the nature of challenges, wouldn't you expect uh, measures that would create such a situation? Uh, I would, here's the challenge that I would have for you. I, I appreciate the fact that, that the president is well received in other places. But I would maintain that the test of effectiveness of foreign policy is not whether you're well liked. Not whether you're well liked. I thought it was a terrible mistake to pull the plug on missile defense, Poland and Czechoslovakia. When you had political figures in those countries that had put themselves out on the line at risk, some voted out of office to stand with this country. And then we made a judgment with little notice. I believe it was in the guise of getting Russian cooperation for dealing with Iran. I think that's the case. I don't know, because I'd never understood it. I think that, I'm trying to figure out was there a rationale. Because the day after that, one of the Russian ministers made some pronouncement as if saying that they would be supportive or open to sanctions. And about two weeks later, they came back and said, that's not in the, in the cards. So the question that you have to ask is, what do we get, what have we gotten out of that? Have we gotten greater cooperation on Iran? Have we gotten, uh, have we gotten Russia to, to pull its troops out of Georgia? What have we gotten out of it? And so, yes, I, I, I think it's very fair to say that, that there has been a kinder, gentler approach. And the only question that I would ask would be, how do we, what do we gauge as effective? Effective in terms of the national security interests of the United States of America. And, and I think that has to be the question that has to be answered. And I, I think at this point, the jury is, at best, the jury is still out. Uh, and I will say, I'm kind of venturing into, into deep waters here, uh, and I looked at a decision recently that was made by the Attorney General to put on trial in New York City Khalid Sheikh Mohammed and others. And I've tried to understand the rationale of that. And it may be, and again, this is just one person surmising, it, it may be that there is this sense that we have to do a better job in showing the world that we're this just country. And this is a way to do that. But the risk to this country of that being a show trial, the risk of information be being shared that would then strengthen al-Qaeda, the whole range of risks. You know, when the, when the parents of Daniel Pearl say that shouldn't take place, I think the risks far outweigh this sense that somehow we got to, you know, show the world that how just we are. I, I believe that we are a pretty just nation. I believe that we have done tremendous good. There is, there is no more generous nation in the world than the United States of America, none. Talk to the people of, of you know, after the typhoons. Who is the United States? And, and so uh, I worry that in this effort to be liked, that somehow we may, we may find ourselves in a position where we're not strengthened. And I think the jury is still out on that. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. The dean made a terrible mistake. He gave me back the microphone. Uh, let me just, uh, just, just one thing. I really appreciate this opportunity, and I appreciate the questions, all the questions. Uh, one of the things, somebody once said, the good Lord gave us two ears and one mouth. Try to use them in that proportion. I, I've told my, the student aides who are working with me, my, my uh, lament in, my first, in the first kind of seminar that I had is that I talked too much and they didn't listen enough. Uh, you know, the question asked about how do we connect with this generation, I don't have the answers to that. I really came to Harvard uh, as much to listen. A lot of smart folks here. You should all, I mean, everyone who's associated with this, you know, you gotta be very proud. This is a difficult place to get into. Again, I, we know our daughter just got into college last year. Pretty tough. And so I really came here to listen to try to hear, is there something that I haven't heard before? Is there something that can educate me further? And then hopefully, in, in some way, I'm, I, I'm a public servant at heart, uh, that I'll be able to use what I heard 
uh, in a positive way to, to be more constructive and to, and to find solutions to some of the challenging questions that have been thrown out here. So I just want to say I want to thank you for being here uh, and to say that you have helped educate me, I hope and, and believe perhaps much more than I have educated you. Thank you and God bless.